Welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD Podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and joining me, as he always does, is Arusha Paris. He is a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm, I'm doing well, Justin. Well, that's great to hear. It's April 10th, 2024. IBD just celebrated its 40th anniversary yesterday. That was when volume number one uh, came out in on April 9th, 1984. I was almost 10 years old. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned on Twitter, I've now spent over half my life at IBD and uh, I, I'm, I'm there at like two thirds of IBD's life. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, quite, quite, quite the ride. But uh, we're going to maybe touch on that a little bit later on in the program. But right now, we've got to get into this whole cryptocurrency, Bitcoin mystery, the having all of those things that are uh, maybe not as familiar to a lot of our listeners, but we want to get into it because it's something that's very important. And to help us dive into that is Will Clemente. He is a the founder of Reflexivity Research. Uh, welcome to the show, Will. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I wasn't even alive when uh, IBD was founded, but hopefully yeah. I can provide some insights you know, here. Uh, that's, yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah, enough yeah, out yeah, of you. We, we, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we don't even be dated here, man. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we, 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 we don't even need to e hear what year you were born. But uh, uh, it's great to have you on the show because sometimes, uh, you know, with, with some of these newer things, it's uh, it's hard to grasp you know, all of this different stuff, the, the technology behind it and some new terms, right? I mean, it's hard enough when you get into stocks, there's a whole, you know, level of terminology that you need to learn. And then if you want to dive into options, there's a whole nother level there. And here we are with cryptocurrency. You've got a number of cryptocurrencies to choose from, which one is best. And then Again, just the term currency sometimes confuses people because, you know, how many currencies do you know that move like Bitcoin does? Uh, so uh, most importantly, I think, you know, just if we, if we want to stay topical right now, uh, one of the things I want to start with is the ETFs. And, you know, this was something for a long time. Uh, they were, you know, fighting against uh, the SEC ahead to get these ETFs going. He thought it was a bad idea. No way. Um, but now we have a number of them. Does that kind of give the cryptocurrency a little stamp of approval now that it's kind of, you know, past that hurdle? Yeah, I think it's a it's a great question. I think you kind of got to separate it into maybe two different baskets of of why it's positive for Bitcoin. I think on the one hand, you have kind of the direct impact of it. It unlocks the ability to allocate to Bitcoin for the first time for you know numerous di different types of entities that maybe for regulatory or compliance reasons couldn't get access to, to allocating to the asset before. Uh, and then on the other side, I think you have maybe a less direct impact, which is kind of the, the pullback of maybe career risk that was associated with being allocated to Bitcoin historically. Um, so I just think, you know, having Fidelity and BlackRock as some of the, some of the largest asset managers in the world, um, kind of putting a stamp of approval on this thing uh, gives kind of a level of credence or, or, a stamp of approval on this that has kind of never been around in, in Bitcoin's 15 year lifespan. Uh, and then just, you know, that's kind of added when you have Larry Fink going on television and talking about how Bitcoin is, you know, something to consider in part of your portfolio, um, you know, how it's how it's digital gold, etc. So uh, I think it's kind of positive all the way around. And, and you know, we've, we've seen this kind of break a, a ton of different records, you know, based on prior yeah. ETF launches. Uh, I think we probably see that continue throughout the rest of the year. So, Will, uh, you know, b before that, let's just take a step back. You know, how did you get into all of this and, you know, really develop your expertise in Bitcoin? Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, everybody who's in this space has a very kind of, uh, you know, unorthodox right. background in terms of kind of kind of getting involved. Mine was basically I was in college. Uh, I was 18 years old. Uh, I was actually uh, working uh, at Target at the time while I was while I was in college and um, I just got involved in investing or initially kind of came into the kind of Warren Buffett uh, approach of, you know, doing discount cash flow models at my desk and things like this. Wow. Um, after COVID, uh, obviously, you know, the, the market started ripping while the economy was, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, supporting that, at least initially. And so I was kind of dumbfounded by this kind of delta between the two, realized that basically, you know, everything's about liquidity in this kind of post 2008 regime uh, and then kind of thought, OK, what's the thing that you want to own? Uh, if liquidity is getting pumped into the system in, in such a massive way, especially uh, after COVID kind of mm -hmm. fell into the whole PTJ thesis of Bitcoin's kind of the fastest horse that you want to own if liquidity is coming into the system, um, began allocating to it with with not a lot of money at the at the time when I was younger, um, began also trading some other uh, you know, kind of crypto assets on the side 
uh, and then just began sharing my thoughts on Twitter. Um, my Twitter account kind of blew up. Now I have over 700,000 followers wow, uh, just wow. by sharing kind of my, my thoughts on Bitcoin and, and the rest of the crypto market. But that's kind of the, the very high level. Mm -hmm. And and when when you were kind of doing your, your research, uh, again, to just kind of dive into this a little bit more, uh, what was it about you know, the, the cryptocurrency specifically, I mean, cause you've got all of these different assets to choose from. Um, what, what was it about it? Because again, this is something that, you know, baffles a lot of people. What made you just kind of, Hey, no, this is, this is where I want to dive in and, and, and learn more. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, there's a lot of noise when you come into the space at the yeah. beginning, <laughs> but you've got it. You've got to really compartmentalize mm. there's Bitcoin as hard money. And, you know, that's competing with all these store value assets. I would I would argue directly with gold right now. Um, eventually, I think the, the whole sovereign debt market. And then you have crypto, which is competing with, you know, all these, um, you know, startups. And it, it's much more kind of tokenized venture or, or kind of, you know, tech startup type of fintech type of, um, of startups that I think you can kind of basket that in with. But they're definitely two different things. Um, I think that the case for Bitcoin is is basically this. You have, you know, an irresponsible amount of debt that's in the country. Um, mm -hmm. You know, our, our payments on interest are now higher than the defense spending last year. Uh, debt to GDP is over 120 um, percent. You've got, you know, guys like Stan Druckenmiller saying he's been ignoring the, the debt to GDP situation for his entire career, but now is factoring that into his portfolio allocation for the first time ever. Um, I think, you know, you've got the debt situation on one side, which, you know, if you think about, OK, what can the U.S. do to basically tackle the debt situation? They can either default on the debt, which they're not going to do. Mm -hmm. They can basically have some type of utopian AI fueled productivity boom. Maybe that happens. I think that's that's pretty low likelihood. The third option is basically to inflate the debt away uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in nominal terms. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm very much in the camp of I think that's the most likely outcome. And over a long enough time horizon, the U.S. just mathematically, unless they're going to default on the debt or we have some crazy productivity boom, uh, they're going to have to continue to debase the currency. Bitcoin is the most, uh, you know, the the most provably scarce asset on the planet. You've got gold. I would argue that Bitcoin beats gold in in every single aspect of it. It's more transportable. It's very viably scarce. Um, you know, it's it's much cheaper. How you know how are you going to move five billion dollars of gold across the planet? Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to move five billion dollars of gold, I can do that by memorizing twelve words and take it anywhere in the world with my brain. Um, so I, I think. Bitcoin basically beats every every aspect of gold uh, and the reasons why people hold it. So I would argue in kind of this world of the situation of the debt. And then also, on the other hand, uh, with the demographic situation, over time, people my age and, and you know, I argue millennials as well, um, you know, they grew up Internet native. Yeah. All right. So they're yeah. much yeah. more susceptible, I think, to be willing to allocate to something like a Bitcoin and definitely over something like gold. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's basically my thesis is that over time, because of the debt situation, and then also you have kind of this digitally native generation that's going to be at the helm of capital allocation, you know, 15, 20 years out from now, um, those kind of two forcing functions, I think, are, are going to kind of what drives assets into, into Bitcoin over time. And then I guess you could also tag on a third one, uh, which is kind of this trend of deglobalization that we've started to see recently. And also, kind of rising geopolitical tensions. But I'll, I'll pause there because I knew I, I threw a ton out. <laughs> well, well, let's get into that deglobalization. How does that, you know, benefit uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, I, I just think um, let, let's take the situation with with Russia and the U.S. because I think yeah. this was arguably one of the kind of biggest watershed moments, or maybe aha moments for different sovereign wealth funds around the world. Maybe you know, thinking about how they want to you know strategically position uh, their country's reserves. If we go back to the beginning of 2022, the U.S. If, if you know effectively just froze Russia's FX reserves mm -hmm. um, yeah. and basically pulled out kind of the the, the nuclear bazooka uh, of what they could possibly do in terms of you know dealing with 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 that aspect of of um, of Russia and, and sanctions. Um, so I think that was kind of a big aha moment or maybe wake up moment for a lot of these countries of okay if if you know we can we can have our assets frozen by the U.S. at any moment without any due process, what do we want to own? I would argue that Bitcoin, even over gold, is is for the reasons that I described why it's superior to gold, um, is something that these countries are probably heavily considering. You know, Bitcoin's still pretty small. It's maybe not super liquid that they can get a meaningful allocation to. But I mean, I would argue there, there's a pretty good case for 
you know, taking a couple basis points of, of a sovereign wealth funds portfolio and, and saying, why don't we allocate to Bitcoin as this thing that, you know, isn't able to, to be seized or uh, is, you know, completely decentralized and isn't controlled by any single entity. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the verifiable scarcity uh, earlier. And one of the things that, of course, is coming that kind of lends to that scarcity is the having, right? It's, you know, there, there is this limited supply and built into the white paper and all the calculations is that, hey, a having is going to happen uh, regularly and that's going to make mining less profitable. Uh, maybe we can go ahead and put from uh, 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 the, the, the web, this is uh, the live Bitcoin having countdown, uh, <laughs> just so people can see what this looks like. This is from watcher.guru. There's a ton of things that you can just find on Google. Uh, Will said, hey, just ty ty type in uh, having tracker and you know this is one that came up. So eight days, 21 hours, 27 minutes, 32 seconds. Uh, what what happens? Uh, I mean, is, is someone pressing a button and, you know, things start blowing up, confetti comes up, fireworks? What 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 happens when this uh, having, you know, comes comes to take place? Yeah. So so basically, like Michael Saylor comes out of the ceiling in a disco ball. <laughs> Does he go on that boat in this background? <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So, so basically, the having is when the supply issuance gets cut in half. So right now, there's roughly 900 Bitcoin that are issued into circulation every day. Uh, after the halving in roughly 10 days, as, as you just mentioned, uh, going down to the second there, which is awesome. It's like the uh, New Year's Eve countdown for the Bitcoin right. guys. Yeah, <laughs> <it's> like, yeah. <laughs> That'll get cut in half to 450 Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, over time, what happens is that Bitcoin's issuance programmatically continues to go down roughly every four years. Um, it's based on block times or, or I'm sorry, the, the block heights, the number of blocks in between the halvings, but blocks come out roughly every 10 minutes. So that's where we refer to, you know, basically these this four year period between them. Um, and so basically what happens is you have this stock to flow ratio of the amount of circulating supply relative to issuance continues to go up. So, you know, if you measure the stock to flow, I don't know exactly what it is off the top of my head, uh, of Bitcoin relative to something like gold, after this having Bitcoin will be provably quantifiably more scarce than gold for the first time ever. Wow. Um, there's a lot of talk of, you know, does, does this basically mean that you're going to have kind of this like supply shock on the market? Mm -hmm. um, I think this was the case early on in like the 2012 or the 2016 halving where the halvings like literally had an impact on the actual price because you know, it was such a large impact relative to the amount of supply and circulation. I don't think that this current halving is that impactful from a pure supply demand standpoint. But well, that being said, okay. No, 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 just real quick, because mm -hmm. I mean, that, that that is the supply side, but you also have not too far from this event, the institutional uh, kind of, okay, ETFs are now available. Yeah. The demand side, and I mean, you know, <laughs> just from high school economics, you know, I, I, I'm, no, I'm no economics major, but <laughs> when you've got a lot of potential demand there and a limited supply event, is, is that what's getting people so excited about this? And is it justified? Yeah, hundred percent. Look, I think I think the story is is much more about the demand side than the supply side. And you are correct, right? Is you know again the, the supply issuance does come down. So technically, you know, based on basic economics, since the supply issuance is coming down, you have more demand. The the having definitely doesn't hurt the the you know the the case for investing in Bitcoin. I'm just saying I don't think that's as big of a driver as maybe it has been in the past, or people like to kind of make it out to be. Um, but nonetheless, I do think it's kind of a good meme or it's kind of a good talking point for institutions to grab onto that Bitcoin is quantifiably more scarce than gold. Uh, I do completely agree with you, though, that the picture is much more about the demand side and kind of, you know, what we just talked about, the ETF, uh, you know, unlocking massive pools of capital to potentially allocate to this thing for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's a certain behavior also with Bitcoin, right? When around the having even even before it can run. And then what does it do after th this actually happens? Yeah, so typically we start to see Bitcoin really rally after the halving. This this okay. kind of cycle, if you will, has been really strange because we've seen Bitcoin reach all time highs before the halving, which is the first time that's ever happened. Again, I, I don't really think the halving um, is that much of a driver of, of price action anymore, just because it's so de minimis relative to the to the circulating supply. I also think you know th there's some Bitcoiners that are in the camp of the halving drives these four year cycles. Again, we've got a small sample size of like three for these things, but there's a camp that says the having drives these four year cycles. I'm kind of in the camp that it's also a combination of, you know, like the liquidity cycles that just drive all assets. 
Um, you know, if you kind of, I love Michael Howell and, and cross border capital, um, you know, guys like this have basically plotted out these kind of liquidity cycles that, that we've seen Bitcoin track really closely. So, you know, the answer is probably it's a combination of a bit of everything. Um, the having definitely has played a, a big factor in the past. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of what we've seen historically, we've historically seen Bitcoin rally after the halving as you kind of have had that supply shock that, that's taken place on the market. And then also, I just think it's kind of a marketing thing for Bitcoin, right, is all of a sudden people are like, oh, uh, yeah, this thing, this thing still exists. Uh, people begin looking into it more and starting to dig into what is the having, and you know maybe people don't even understand that that Bitcoin is you know uh, absolutely scarce. There's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be in circulation, etc. So um, I think there's a couple different kind of factors that that drive that four-year cycle that we've seen historically for Bitcoin. Uh, but the having's definitely been a pretty big piece in there. Mm -hmm. And on the store value thing, because again, this was this was something that was really hard for me to wrap my head around because you always think of, OK, you know, gold, that store of value and, you know, the, the hedge against inflation. And when you look at uh, a chart of Bitcoin, it's it's sometimes, well, how is this storing value when it's this volatile? You know, and um, I, I it wasn't until I, I listened to a few podcasts and someone was like, well, gosh, if you just look at a, you know, if you take that larger approach back away from the day to day and look at, you know, like a four year time frame. Oh, OK, now now I can see it type thing where it, it does it does kind of store that value. But um, is is the expectation that the volatility is going to decrease as the liquidity increases here? Is it going to trade more like a currency? And then if it does, does that kind of make it less exciting? Like, I mean, if it's just, you know, oh, well, if I if I if I can't be up 10 percent in a day or in, you know, in, in a few minutes sometimes, does, does that take the excitement away from it? Sure. So I guess we could first start with uh, the store value piece and then and then get to the volatility. Um, you know, I, I think the way that I think of store value is, is kind of what you described of looking at on the, the four year time frames of, you know, how does this thing store value over a long enough period of time? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin has been the best performing asset in the history of mankind. Uh, it's outperformed everything over the last 10 and 15 years. You know, those first five years were really just a very early adoption. So you can make an argument to kind of cut those years out. Um, but I think just structurally, what what is Bitcoin? It's a you know provably scarce asset while you have, uh, you know, an increasing amount of uh, money that's going to have to be produced to basically service the debt uh, in the U.S. And so, you know, I don't I don't really like this this argument of, you know, for example, saying the dollar is a good store of value because it's one dollar. Well, you know, there's more there's more dollars being produced. So, yeah, sure, you have one dollar if that's your unit of account. Right. But overall, those dollars are worth less. And when you plot it out against we just had the CPI report out today. Right. You know, or, exactly. or yet, yet, yes. Was it today? Yeah, it was today. So <laughs> yesterday. Exactly. Right, and, yeah. and look, I think I think CPI is flawed. Like forget CPI. Just look at assets. Right. Just look at mm -hmm. look, look at the S&P. Look at real estate. Look at even gold. Look at look at Bitcoin. Right. In, in asset price terms, you know, the things that you actually want to buy and allocate to to generate wealth over time, if you're holding dollars, you're, you're losing the amount of those things that you can acquire over time. So I would argue that the dollar is the absolute worst store of value. When you look at, you know, everything priced in Bitcoin terms over time, all of those things have come, come down. So for Bitcoiners over the last five or 10 years, everything has become cheaper in, in Bitcoin terms. So I think, you know, Bitcoin has really kind of funda fundamentally made people question, you know, what is a store of value? You know, what are, what are yeah. kind of the traits that, that makes a good store of value? There's definitely been currencies that have been way worse than the dollar. The dollar is obviously still the, the world reserve currency. You know, it's the most clean shirt in the pile of dirty laundry of, of fiat currencies. <laughs> um, but I would argue that, that Bitcoin is, is, is the best store of value and will probably continue to be just based on the traits that it holds. And then especially when you're measuring it, you know, in dollars. And then I also think, you know, as it continues to devour other, you know, monetary premiums, let's say, you know, gold, real estate, et cetera, you plot out a chart of, you know, BTC relative to gold. Well, you've been able to acquire an increasing amount of, of, of gold in, in Bitcoin terms over the last five or 10 years. Um, I suspect that will be continue to, to be the case. Um, the second part of your question going on onto the volatility. Um, yeah, I think the volatility will come down. And that's just kind of the, the nature of an asset right. as it matures, it becomes more liquid. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of goes both ways. Yes, the returns will come down, uh, but also I think Bitcoin counterintuitively is more de-risked at 70K than it was at 10K. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the infrastructure is better. We've now got BlackRock, Fidelity, you know, offering access to it. 
but also there's more liquidity. So, you know, if some large sovereign wealth fund or, you know, some, some large pension fund wants to get exposure, they're able to get in and out with less slippage than they would have at, at 10 K. Um, you know, Bitcoin's still nowhere near as, as liquid as the treasury market, for example, but it's, it's, it's improving over time. And I think that will continue to, to, you know, drive more flows into the asset. And, you know, some of these sovereign wealth funds will be able to say, okay, well, you know, we can allocate more than two basis points. Now we can take a percent or 2% or 3%, whatever it is. Um, and so I think, yes, over time, that, vol that volatility will come down. But I do suspect that Bitcoin, you know, kind of trades similar to the S&P where we get this slow grind up over time. And what's driving that again, it, it, yes, you know, obviously part of, uh, part of indices coming up is just, you know, over time, technological improvements, productivity goes up, you know, GDP rises. Um, but I think the, the even bigger driver of that has basically been the increase in, in money supply. Like if you look at the S&P or the NASDAQ measured against M2, it's actually like barely up from 2008, mm -hmm. uh, where, where Bitcoin has, has been up a lot. Maybe, yeah. maybe you could argue for Bitcoin specifically, that's a bit unfair because that was like the, the origin of the asset. But the point about the, the point about the S&P, uh, they it still stand. So yeah, you change that denominator and it makes a big difference. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, so, so, so you actually the risk. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to get into yep. some of these scandals too. But you know, do, do you want to get into something else before we get into that? Sure. Yeah. Oh, we can get we can get spicy if you want to. Let's well, no. Well, actually, because I I think one thing that will be really interesting to to our listeners is one of your stock picks, right? Uh, and it is, uh, I guess, outside of Bitcoin, one of your biggest bets. You know. Talk to uh, talk to us a little bit about Coinbase and and why you think this is a uh, one of the more misunderstood equities. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think kind of the the maybe two sentence thesis on big on uh, on Coinbase is basically that I think it's kind of the largest venture style bet in public markets maybe since Tesla like five years ago, and I think that's just because there's a fundamental misunderstanding between the street. And some of the crypto native revenue verticals that the business have that has that some of the crypto native guys understand. Um, so to date, you know, Coinbase has basically been viewed kind of as just a pure exchange where obviously the majority of the revenue they, they generate from the fees on the platform. Yeah. Um, I think over time that will be less the case. And if you look at basically the, the revenue from fees as a percentage of their over, overall revenue, that's continuing to go down. Things like the staking revenue uh, is going up. Uh, another piece that uh, I don't well, think what, what is staking? Uh, yeah, because I sure. thought it was more of an Ethereum, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah hundred, mm hundred -hmm. um, mm percent. -hmm. So there's there's proof of work assets, and then there's proof of stake assets. Um, for the proof of stake assets, you have to basically lock up some of uh, you know the the tokens in exchange for validating the network or securing the network, and then you're rewarded with token inflation. Okay. Um, Based, and, and that's what we've referred to as staking. So Coinbase has staking offerings on the platform. The biggest one is Ethereum, uh, and they generate fees based on that. That's an increasing portion of, of the business. Um, also, you know, if you get an Ethereum ETF approved down the line, I think with Gary Gensler in office, there's a pretty low likelihood of that this year, especially after they just sued Uniswap today, uh, or at least put a, put a Wells notice out against Uniswap, which is the largest decentralized exchange on ETH. Um, but it should, should, you know, you get basically a, you know, ETH, ETH ETF or uh, a staked ETH ETF. Um, my guess is that Coinbase is going to be the one that benefits from that in the same way that they've been the custodian for every single ETF, except for, um, except for, uh, VanX, which I believe uses Gemini for custody on, on the Bitcoin side. Um, so there's the staking revenue. The other piece, uh, that I haven't heard anybody on the street talking about is Coi uh, Coinbase has an Ethereum L2, a, a layer two which is basically a scaling solution on top of the Ethereum base layer um, called base. And so, you know, when you, when you think about what, what competitive advantage does Coinbase have over all the other Ethereum L2s, well, they have the largest distribution of almost entity, any entity in the entire crypto space. They have 100 million users on the platform. So what they're going to do is basically take this L2, this Ethereum L2 and all the, the applications that launch on top of it, all the decentralized exchanges, their social apps being built on top of this, betting markets that are crypto native being built on top of this, all these things. And they'll just slap it on the back end of Coinbase and you'll be interacting on chain on this base Ethereum L2 without even real, realizing it. So we call that in crypto chain abstraction or, or account abstraction. 
Um, so it's basically, you know, you're abstracting away all the complexity of, you know, setting up your own hardware wallet and, you know, approving yeah. smart contracts mm -hmm. and all these things. So I think Coinbase has this competitive advantage to be able to onboard all these users on their ETH L2 that none of the other uh, L2s have. And over the last 30 days, we've seen the activity on base skyrocket. Um, we're now up to 30 million in revenue that that's generated on the sequencer fees, which is basically Coinbase batches the, the transactions together before they're settled down on the Ethereum L1 um, and th they generate revenue from those sequencer fees. 30 million in the last you know, 30 days, that's you know, roughly you know, 350, 360 million dollars annualized. I think, you know, that'll continue to rise as, as the activity on base uh, continues to go up and as they continue to integrate the L2 more into the platform uh, and, and the kind of uh, the way that I just described. So, you know, I think that's a, a piece of, of revenue that I haven't heard anyone talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a great example of, you know, there's there's different aspects of Coinbase's business, which basically kind of make it this what I would call kind of a crypto super app where I think now the, the street has been kind of viewing it as just a, a pure exchange. Mm -hmm. it, every time you open your mouth, I have like five more questions uh, <laughs> that, that, that come up. I, I do um, like that crypto <laughs> super app, though. That, that's a yeah, good yeah, right. Really and so uh, maybe you know we're we're gonna skip the scandals uh, scandal part, and sure. let's let's go ahead and shift to uh, you know Coinbase is definitely what sticks out to you in terms of uh, other stock related kind of plays. Um, but what about the miners? You know, again, if it's if it's harder to, um, or I guess less profitable to mine after the halving, what does that do to the miners, you know, math basically in terms of profitability and, and their value? Yeah, of course. So, um, so, you know, as you just mentioned, the halving, uh, will impact miner revenues because they get cut in half, um, in Bitcoin terms. And if, if the USD exchange rate hasn't changed then in USD terms as well. Um, but, what we've seen historically is that after the having Bitcoin is run, so that offsets that you know decline in, in the issuance. Um, and so because of that, historically, um, as in mostly just last cycle after after the the twenty the May twenty twenty uh, having, we started to see these miners really run following the having. Um, we've start we've seen miners really underperform Bitcoin over the last month or two. I think a lot of that is because having has been getting priced in because the market's obviously forward looking. And so miners now are trading kind of where they were when Bitcoin was trading roughly 30, 35K. So I would argue the market's already priced in that kind of decline in, in the issuance. I think as we approach the halving here in 10 days, um, you know, maybe you start to get, I love the traditional media organizations, but as we start to get big headlines about on CNBC mm -hmm. about why miners are screwed because they're having their, their revenues getting cut in half, maybe that's when you want to start actually scaling into the miners because the, the market's forward looking. Uh, if the having you know impacts Bitcoin's price in the way that it previous uh, you know historically has, that will offset the the decline in revenue. Um, the other thing is that all these miners uh, have been stacking it. Well, I should say all of them. A lot of these miners have been stacking a lot of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Also, the 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 value of the miner rigs that they have uh, also goes up. You know when when Bitcoin price goes up because more people want to mine. Uh, and then the other piece that I think is interesting that um, I would argue a lot of the street maybe isn't aware of with, with Bitcoin. There's been a ton of development on top of Bitcoin, um, both on L2. So similar to, to Ethereum, you have these layer twos that are built on top of Bitcoin and then settled down back on the on the base layer settlement network. Um, that I think could potentially be kind of a white horse for these miners in terms of all the activity that takes place on top of Bitcoin. Of course, again, it has to get settled back on the settlement network and you have to pay miners the fees to transact all of that. So, you know, let's say even a, even a tenth of the activity, you know, Uniswap is the largest decentralized exchange on Ethereum. They've done $2 trillion in cumulative volume over the last two years. Let's say 10% of that comes to Bitcoin. That's going to be a large amount of, of, of fee revenue, or at least on, on a relative basis to their overall revenue that wasn't around last cycle. Um, the other thing that, that is uh, interesting, in addition to the L2s that's kind of new on top of Bitcoin are these things called ordinals. So these are uh, what we call inscriptions. They're basically, you can store metadata um, in, in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, this was enabled by this soft fork that took place at the end of 2021 called Taproot. So you can now store images, video, and text natively into uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, we've kind of seen two mini bubbles in these ordinals so far. I think there's a pretty good likelihood that they may go on like a Ethereum NFT in 2021 style run over the next year or two, especially because of the wealth effect that may take place from, you know, large, large holders or, or whales on, on BTC. Um, and also the, the miners are incentivized to 
you know, fund some of these projects and kind of push this activity because again, it, it revenue, it, it benefits them on the back end in terms of revenue coming from the fees that people need to pay the miners to, to get these transactions approved on the network. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple of reasons why these miners are, are interesting. Uh, the clearest one is just after the having we've, we've seen these miners run historically as, you know, the, the decline in the issuance kind of gets priced through. Uh, the other piece is, you know, a potential white horse in terms of some of the stuff that's getting built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Any any miners in particular that are kind of your favorite go tos? Um, I mean, there, there's the the Wagme uh, miner ETF. Um, I, I think, you know, maybe that's probably the, the best way to get exposure to miners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the Clean Spark is pretty interesting. Um, Riot was interesting to me during the bear market because they had the lowest amount of debt. But you know, now that we're heading back into a into a bull, maybe maybe that's not the one that that you want to own. Um, Mare has been doing a ton. Also, you know, some stuff on, on the on the AI side. Um, so miners also, you know, for the ones that uh, that are also using some of their data centers for AI, there's an argument to be made that they're kind of an overlap of a Bitcoin right. and an AI infrastructure play. So there's some of the, some of that stuff going on. Uh, I don't have any exposure to them right now, so I'm not like super super well versed on differentiating between all of them. But I think they're worth looking into as we start to get the having price through over the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you've definitely given us given us a lot to think about in terms of uh, what's going to happen with the having and again, ways in which we might uh, view our exposure a little bit differently and uh, the opportunities that could be coming as a result. So really thank you for coming on and uh, and and schooling us on all that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, and thank you know what? Before you go, you mentioned that you're, you know, you're active on X. Um, what What is your handle there so that we can uh, maybe have folks follow you there and uh, get more information on all this research that you're doing? Oh, uh, sure. My uh, Twitter handle is W Clementi, I, I, I. Uh, and then you can also follow the research firm at reflexivityresearch.com. We've got well over 100 uh, example reports on there. A lot of them are paywalled for for our paid uh, members, but we also put out a bunch of free ones as well that you can kind of dive into. Awesome. awesome. Thanks again. That's Will Clemente, founder of Reflexivity Research. Uh, so great stuff. Uh, when we come back, we're going to get into the markets a little bit and some stocks that are setting up. So stay tuned. It's going to be Arusha and I next. Talk to you soon. We're back. It's the Investing with IBD podcast. And it's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Paris. We just had a great section on Bitcoin and uh, the halving and all that uh, with Will Clemente. But now we're going to get into a little bit of the markets and stocks. So, you know, starting out, I mean, when we look at the market, it's Thursday was kind of the day that's really kind of setting a range here. You know, we had uh, a big outside day on Thursday last week, and it seems like right now we're just staying within that range. Um, you know, we, we have this heavy distribution level, but we never really saw the price breaks uh, to accompany that. We finally kind of, you know, spent a little bit of time below the 21 day moving average line, but it certainly seems like at least on the NASDAQ, this 50 day line is coming a little bit more into focus. What do you think, Arusha? Yeah, I think this is almost in many ways a perfect under pressure type of environment. Yeah. You know that you're collecting distribution, but it's not necessarily an environment where you immediately run for the hills, right? Yeah. Uh, there, there are enough stocks out there underneath the surface that are still hanging in there. We're losing some stocks, but. Um, but yeah, uh, from the index level, that last Thursday's that big reversal bar, that's one one kind of big uh, big area, big level to watch. And of course, the low of that bar uh, from last Thursday is almost lining up perfectly with that fifty day. So yeah, everything there is lining up. Um, and the sixteen thousand level. And the 16, you know, we've been talking about that sixteen thousand level, and oh look, there it is. You know, kind of thing. So yeah, a lot of things lining up there. Yeah, but you know what's what's kind of interesting though is like even today, uh, was it today or was it yesterday? I, I can't even remember these days. But when the CPI number came out, yeah, that was uh, yesterday, right? Uh, yeah, and then today, today was Fed minutes. Uh, yesterday was CPI. Okay, so so and and we were gapping down, but we were gapping. Were we gapping down today? Today, <laughs> this morning, <laughs> were we get were we gapping down? Yeah, yeah, we gapped down. Yeah, we gapped okay. down at the open. The, but the futures number, didn't look so bad. But yeah. Then, um, yeah, we gapped down at the open. Okay, mm -hmm. but a number of stocks they kind of held in there still right mm -hmm. and the market kind of held in there still right so well the, nvidia like turned green like pretty quickly uh right, into the right. session as, as yeah and, and we both and own, i do have a position we, we in both NVIDIA. own nvidia too right yeah. so mm -hmm. and so yeah so nvidia was kind of the key stock 
Um, and uh, and you guys are doing a great job on IBD Live too. And I, um, and we were all watching it, right? And and so that was kind of the first clue that you know give give the let let the stocks kind of let's see how they handle for the throughout the day to mm-hmm. see if they really are going to keep selling off or if they're going to start finding support here. And and so I think that that is the key is not only the market and, and going getting back to the Nasdaq here gap down but recovered some of yeah. some of those losses still above the 50 uh, and so a lot of times when you see that especially after such a big run still has a chance here mm-hmm. it definitely looks resilient you know to me it's it's not it's not given up like you know you would almost expect after that big outside day on Thursday you would have expected potentially more weakness and especially when you had a CPI come in hotter than expected if if it were a different market, less forgiving, you would have easily seen that go below the 50-day moving average. Right, and right. it didn't. So there is an element of resilience, but at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, we went to under pressure on the big picture on Thursday uh, because again we had that heavy distribution, and then that was kind of a price break yeah. to accompany the distribution. So that was kind of a definitely a shot across the bow. But and then on that last Thursday, right? I, yeah, mm-hmm. immediately it was like, okay, we finally got our first kind of big hit we're yeah. probably going to pull in more we we'll probably break the 50 day in the next few days and stocks are going to break their support areas and and now we're definitely going to build, build bases but we haven't seen that yet right it's yeah. which was that was kind of interesting where the friday it did bounce back and it's still holding in there yeah and now if you look at the s p 500 kind of a similar story except that the s p 500 actually had a little bit more room above its 50-day moving average line so it it actually has been a little bit stronger we've been mentioning i mean if you look at the you know the nasdaq or the Qs, the relative strength on those was actually kind of dipping for a little bit uh you know versus the s p 500 so s p 500 arguably a little bit uh, a little bit stronger but i did think it was interesting today um, the, the, the prior few days I was watching RSP pretty closely, which is the equal weighted S and P 500. And that wow, seemed that. to be holding up much better than the S and P 500, but it looked a little bit weaker today. Uh, and I mean, the advancers versus decliners, I mean, the, the ratio was so far in favor of the decliners. It was a, a pretty big one, but, um, you know, a lot of things were off their lows, but RSP kind of showed, okay, well, that was a little bit weak overall uh on the equal weighted so yeah so when you combine that with okay you're seeing the rsp getting a little bit weaker Mm -hmm. than the the cues or the spies starting to see nvidia showing some support you're starting to see some more buying in some of the larger cap tech stocks maybe the market shifts more towards a narrow type of market like we saw the beginning of 2023 yeah yeah so that remains to be seen um but yeah, I think, uh, again, I think we're in kind of a wait and see right now. It, it's almost like we need a little bit more information. Um, I feel like, you know, kind of like what we were talking about last week with Mike on the regression channel lines, we've got right now Thursday acting as our our gutters for this bowling alley lane. Um, and we'll just have to see if we if we hit one of those gutters and, and you know, what happens afterwards. Well, uh, and, and certainly, and, 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 and Justin, just very quickly, and, and on the investor's uh, on investors.com, the exposure is around what forty to sixty or forty to sixty, right? Yeah, so which is so, almost perfect type of under pressure. That that kind of yeah, makes sense, I think. Yeah, exactly. So you don't want to be completely out in case we bounce off the fifty-day moving average line, but you don't want to be too heavy in case you know we break the other way. So and it, what about market school? Uh, market school, yeah, we're at about fifty-five percent. You know, okay. uh, the exposure level is at two. Uh, it got down to one, and so the floor because uh, we are still in the power trend. Uh, although it's under pressure, it has been under pressure since the distribution piled up. Um, you know, so that floor kind of keeps you in uh, at least at, at 35, uh, you know, 35 percent. And but yeah, we did we did get up to or no, 30 percent. And then we did get up to 55 because we did have a break above the 21 day moving average line. Um, you know, it, it was it was a little subtle, but um you know, when when you looked at and it wasn't much of an up day, we were up like uh 0.03 on um on was that 
Monday. Yeah, we were up 0. 0.03 on Monday. Yep. And the low stayed above the 21 day moving average line. That day. Oh, no, and that, that was our break above the. Yeah, I, I oh, you have the, to. Yeah, on the NASDAQ, you have to actually look at the numbers because you can't tell by the <laughs> by the chart. Um, but the, the low did stay above that 21 day moving average line. So. Um, so, yeah, that that kind of increased our exposure. But you certainly don't want to be getting, you know, too top heavy until, again, you kind of see a little bit more recovery. But certainly worth watching individual stocks because those individual stocks that are maybe getting to um you know breaking above their thursday areas i think are the ones to watch right now so uh, when we come back we're going to get a little bit more into some of those stocks that are on our radar maybe uh showing a little bit of relative strength right now stay tuned we'll be right back Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Paris, who joins me every week. He's a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And of course, uh, one of the things that we were celebrating here uh, at IBD was, was the anniversary, 40th anniversary. Um, you know, Arusha mentioned, well, gosh, for the 30th anniversary, you guys were ringing the bell at the New York <laughs> Stock Exchange. Uh, not much fanfare this time. And I guess the fact that we're owned by Dow Jones now and, you know, it's a it's a hundred year old company. They're kind of <laughs> like, well, you know, 40. I mean, come on, call us call us when you get into the in, into the century mark. Um, but, uh, you know, and anything that you wanted to kind of say about the anniversary? I mean, I, I don't remember getting roses sent from you. <laughs> I didn't even know. Anything. It's so <laughs> funny because I didn't know because I didn't see it on the site. I only heard, I knew about it because uh, it was mentioned on IBD Live. But obviously, you know, it, it's it, it is a, it's pretty amazing for 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the impact for for so many of us, me included, uh, that the the paper and bill has had on us. And so it's, uh, I, yeah, when, when I saw that, I was like, yes, but should put something on, <laughs> make it a yeah. little bit more noticeable, send a tweet at least. But, well, well, you but, know, and I, I didn't, I didn't even get to tweet it out until the end of the day, you know, where I kind of like, at, uh, you know, it was like evening time and I, I finally tweeted something out and it was, uh, you know, basically how, how, how long I've been there. And it's so funny because I'm not even the longest, you know, I, yeah. I'm not even close. You're, you're, There's, you're just a newbie there. So. Right. You know, I mean, you know, we always mention Susan Warfel, who is our managing editor. She's actually been at the paper since before that first issue came out because nice. there was all the, you know, preparing for the issue and everything. So she's been there uh, for over 40 years uh, now. So uh, and you got Chris Gessel, who's been there uh, just, just a year or two ahead of me, as, as was Ed Carson. Ken Shreve was in the customer service department, education, wow. uh, you know, answering emails on AOL uh, when I started in customer service. Um, yeah, so there, there's a number of us that have been, you know, up there in, in terms of our years uh, uh, and stuff. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. It's, I can't imagine the, the direction that my life would have taken without without IBD. And this was something I I fell into. Someone was asking, how how did you how did you hear about IBD? And I was I was at a temp agency looking for a job for a year before I got my teaching credential. And uh, they said, you know, what do you think about this customer service job at a financial newspaper? And I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah, see, you know, I'm interested in the stock market. I'll give <laughs> I'll it a do shot it for a week or two. <laughs> yeah. It, well, well and, and it was, it was, you know, I was planning on doing it for a year and that's what I told them, you know, when I got hired, oh, I'll do yeah. this for a year. And uh, then one year turned into two, then, you know, Bill O'Neill tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, you want to be my assistant? I'm like, well, I can't pass that up, you know? And then one year turned into 27 somehow. So. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it is it is pretty incredible. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, definitely congrats to to everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we definitely miss you over at the the old the old offices uh, there and seeing, <laughs> yeah. the paper, and seeing the paper being made every being day made. Yes, exactly. There. All of that stuff. So, yeah, there, there, there was something special when you could watch the papers, uh, you know, coming off the printing press and, and stuff. That was fun to watch. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's still happening somewhere, just not as often, right, with the weekly. Uh, and, you know, for those of you that don't know, when we first came out, it was actually Investors Daily. The business yep. got added into 1991. Uh, some of you might have the 20th anniversary special book that came out by David Hatman Chung. Uh, that, that was The Making of Millionaires. Uh, I got so a first was, day, too. Yeah, that was the 20th. Point. It's crazy to think of, you know, I was telling it David, is this is the yeah. 20th anniversary of your book. You know, I mean, how crazy is that? So I have to have David sign it. Yeah. When, when he says, yeah, gonna... yeah. You know what? That's, that's not a bad idea. I'm going to have to do that next time I'm in the office. Uh, so, okay, let's get into some stocks because one of the things that really kind of stuck out to me was there are a number of stocks that either 
Thursday was like a non-issue, you know, for them. They just kind of brushed it off. It was like nothing or they immediately recovered. So maybe we could take a look at some of those and we can start with AAON. It's so strange. You know, you, 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 you don't think of AC and heating products as being like, oh, the, the be all end all. Of course, there are a number of people that have been saying like, OK, th th there's a few things going on. There's there's some, um, you know, changes that have happened because of environmental uh, laws. And so, okay, you got to change this about your, your units, you know? So, you know, there's something going on there. There's also, Hey, with all this AI stuff that requires quite a bit of cooling. And, uh, mm -hmm. since we talked about cryptocurrency earlier, those miners, uh, they use a lot of energy and those computers, you know, need to be cooled down when they're making all those calculations. So, uh, that might be a, a component here as well, but, you know, just looking at the, the, the chart here, I mean, I'm, I'm looking and let's go to the daily real quick, because if you point out where Thursday was, Thursday, of course, was April 4th. You know, it wasn't too bad of a day, uh, not nearly as bad looking as, you know, the, the indexes were. But Friday was a breakout, you know, yeah. like that was unexpected. You know, that's certainly not what was happening with most stocks uh, that are trading within that Thursday range. Now, granted, it, you know, kind of came in after the breakout and uh, tested that buy point. But uh, what's what's your take on this one? Yeah, so I, I thought Friday that was a, a perfect type of breakout. And uh, especially, like you said, with the market being on edge there and you start to see one of these stocks breaking out and finishing right at the highs on that day. It's like, uh, I was like, okay, I, this one could, you know, be continue its leadership. And and yeah, as, as you said before, you know, these AC stocks have just been going through the roof for, for a while. Um, but I think the last two days also are a good example of how tough it is to make progress in an under pressure type yeah. of environment. Right. And it gets very frustrating. And so if you bought extended, cause this got up to around 5% above the pivot, mm -hmm. you're probably getting shit. You probably got sh shaken out today, right? You got right. stopped out today uh, to manage your risk. And naturally, right. When you sell it, or at least that's happens to me, right. When I sell it, it bounces and goes right back up without me. Right. And mm -hmm. so, um, and this, you look at it at the end of the day and like, why did I sell it? This I know like it's so frustrating, <laughs> so frustrating, but, and, but the reason why, and I, and you know, it's very frustrating, but I, and I know for the most part, I'm always going to sell right at the lows on that day. Uh, but there are some of those times where they go a lot lower and yeah. that's why I do it. Right. That's why I'm okay. You know, looking like an idiot sometimes literally selling right at the lows on the, on the day, but that's, it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, this is where it makes it really tough. So when you are in an under pressure type environment, you definitely want to pay, pay attention. It's, it's almost even more important in an under pressure or a correction type of environment to pay attention, what stocks are breaking out, what stocks are acting really well, because in many ways, especially when you're coming out of a correction, those might be the next batch of leaders uh, in the next phase of a bull market. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't want to be too aggressive and you want to be that much more precise yeah. because there's going to be more volatility when you're in this type of environment. That's exactly what I was going to say. You have to be so much more careful of uh, buying extended. You know, in a, in a different market, it can be a little bit more forgiving. And that's almost worse because you can you can get some bad habits because you're you're rewarded for buying extended oh i bought extended but it just kept on going up i'm glad i did that uh but then in a less forgiving environment you buy extended and then normal action and you're you're faced with that decision okay do i risk you know letting this small loss turn into a big loss or you know do i do i really kind of you know, stick, stick to my rules, stick to my loss cutting rules and risk that I'm going to get out of the low and watch this thing just turn around without me. Cause again, what, what AAON did, I mean, that was normal action, you know, but if you bought extended, how do you, how do you handle that? You know, it's your, your, your math starts not working in your direction. And I will say that's one of the reasons why in a, in a under pressure environment, I kind of like reversals a lot yeah. when you're in kind of that, that tricky thing, because the 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 upside reversal kind of sets a low for you and it's like you know pretty quickly if if that reversal isn't working you know if it undercuts the low of the reversal boom you know you're you're out and then it's just a matter of making sure you're choosing a stock that's not too volatile to where the reversal is you know 
a 10 percent you know down to the low you know even if you're even if you're buying it on the day of the reversal you have to just know the the volatility of your stock yeah and, and another thing that i do approach and I, and I i have tried a number of smaller positions but the over the last week or so but uh, the yeah the key is small smaller a lot smaller yeah. type of positions mm -hmm. where it's there are more probes right now where okay these are coming back to key support areas maybe these are upside reversals but i've done it in the past where you get too aggressive especially after you it, it's been a very strong market and you get away with a lot of those bad habits mm -hmm. you immediately come back in with those same kind of larger positions and you give back too much of the gains that you made you know the last three four months mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's let's go ahead and shift over to another one. Uh, let's pull up Trade Desk. Uh, we were talking a little bit about this because uh, our our producer was talking about his experience with covering this stock and uh, company. And uh, you you mentioned a, a great way of looking at the fundamental side of it. You know, what is it they do? Well, you've got Google, you've got Meta, and if you want to advertise with them, you can go straight to them. If you want to advertise with anyone else, you go to Trade Desk. So uh, certainly in the advertising you know space, digital advertising space, they're a big a big player. But on the on the stock, what I really like about this is, I mean, you look at the 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 big move that it had on its last earnings report, and it really kind of stayed in the upper half of that range. So looking at that week, um, big big move on that week, you know, oh, oh, almost twenty five percent. But it it held for the most part. It really kind of I wouldn't call it necessarily tight. Um, you know, it was a nineteen percent depth, but. It, it held in the upper half of that range. So I think that was a positive. And if you kind of look at the daily, you're you're seeing kind of this cup with handle look to it uh, after that after that big move on earnings. And the, this handle just looks really good to me. You know, what about you? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the handle is almost picture perfect. I mean, just going quickly back to the, the weekly, uh, and this was, this was almost 10 years. I think this was probably 10 years ago, Justin, but w years ago, a number of us all got together. We went to Chicago and we did the first trading summit for Investors Business Daily. And five or six of us had, we, we focused on certain topics, spent 20 minutes in front of this huge, huge crowd. It, it was it was pretty an amazing uh crowd there it was unbelievable I, i'm actually. just i'm just remembering you saying justin has to be on time i mean yeah justin, justin, justin was time, like but... justin was my biggest worry because trying to get justin to do anything in 20 minutes is very very difficult but uh but the topic that i covered was called faulty to constructive and these bases that are they're faulty they're flawed bases bill would always talk about this uh when analyzing stocks uh, but then eventually they can get more sound, they can get more constructive. And so when mm -hmm. you look at it, a trade desk, it's this big consolidation, it's 34% it's really depth, 34% depth. It's almost essentially straight off the bottom, mm -hmm. but then it's putting in a much more constructive cup with handle, right? The yeah. consolidation is not necessarily the type of patterns we generally look for. That's more a trading range. But now it's putting in a couple of the handle. Those are the type of patterns. And this is now the depth is only 19%. That handle is looking really good, only 6%. Mm -hmm. So that is, in many ways, a subtle sign of accumulation, right? That's yeah. a where it now could increase the probabilities that it could work. Of course, all these things, you know, they, there's never 100% and it definitely could fail. But looking at that daily chart, looking at the within the handle how it's all kind of closing at that same range and you're having a little bit of upside reversals here uh on low volume mm -hmm. it's it's acting in a in a pretty volatile market right now it, it's pretty impressive what uh trade desk is doing so i think it's worth uh adding to watch us and, and doing more research on it yeah and if you if you do need to do a little bit more research this was recently a stock of the day ibd stock of the day so you can definitely check out that article uh you can just go to the search on investors.com put in ttd and that that'll come up um and certainly one of the things i feel like is happening with a lot of the the better better looking stocks is you are seeing those setups they're getting support at moving average lines a lot of them a lot of them are getting support at their 21 day moving average lines uh, which is corresponding to their 10 week moving average lines. Interestingly yes. enough, you usually, you know, so would funny. think, you know, 10 week would be, um, you know, associated with a 50 day. But for a lot of these, the the moves up have been so strong that it's it's really kind of the 10 week has kind of caught up to it, you know, yep. as these have gone gone sideways a little bit. Um, and, you know, this one, the Thursday, it, this hasn't crossed Thursday's high yet, uh, the April 4th high. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, as you said, it's it's just been acting very well. You know, it, it Thursday doesn't really stick out to me as a as a bad day. Uh, so that was definitely something interesting on this one. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and turn our attention to another one. Uh, this is Axon Enterprise, of course. Uh, for for you model book lovers, you might remember the big move in Taser. Taser changed its name to Axon. Um, and, you know, they're not doing just the tasers anymore. They're getting into a lot of other different things, um, you know, whether it's cameras, other non-lethal, um, you know, methods of enforcement. Um, and gosh, you look at the tight action here, really big move on its earnings. And it's just, it, it hasn't even challenged the, the, the halfway point. It's just really stuck in the upper quartile, it seems like. And this is a great example of one. Uh, when you look at the daily or you, you look at the weekly here, it's the 10 week moving average line that it's right at. And you look at the daily and it's a 21 day moving average line that it's that it's uh, kind of gravitating around. So uh, this is a good example of that. And and I do have a position in this myself. Um, right. We we are considering it for swing traders. So I might um, I might actually have to get out of that position. We'll see. Um, but um, yeah, tight action. Uh, what's what's your take on this one? Yeah, I, I think uh, well, so so really some of the newer things for Axon, and it's been over the last few years. They they're they're the ones with the body cams, right? So all, all yeah. the police officers there, and if you see like police footage and, and stuff like that, it does say Axon uh, mm -hmm. on on the videos. But it's not only the body cam footage, but it, they're in many ways they've become a SaaS company, so yeah. software as a service the company, mm -hmm. right? And so that's that's where they're just kind of getting that consistent revenue and. If you're, if you're a police department and a number of other, I'm, I'm assuming fire departments and other services out there, military, uh, th this is like the only, it's yeah. the, the dominant player in, in many ways, the only game in town to, to get into. So uh, the market's finally, uh, or has been really uh, realizing that over the last couple of years here. And yeah, you have that strong earnings gap forming a really nice flat pace here. And you're also getting the blue dot. Uh, mm -hmm. here. So while a number of other stocks are starting to correct more during when the market is under pressure, here's Axon going sideways. And as a result, showing a little bit more relative strength and only 2% off its 52 week highs. So showing a lot of strength here and uh, potentially setting up. Yeah. And if you want to see what, you know, SaaS, the subscription as a service can do, you know, just look at Adobe and its move from 2012 when it, you know, <laughs> shifted from the, uh, the, the licensed product to the subscription as a service. I mean, that was, wow. you know, that was what fueled that move there. And it was phenomenal. And now so many more. more. Not, not yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. And so many companies, you know, kind of took note and followed suit. They're like, oh, wait, yeah, if we could get this you know, this steady revenue as opposed to, okay, well, now we've come up with a new version of the software, you know, everything kind of comes in, all the revenue comes in at once and then, yeah. you know, nothing happens and, you know, until the next uh, update. Uh, yeah, it definitely, definitely smoothed out a lot of those earnings. And, um, you know, now, now you look at Adobe and it's, um, you know, it's, it's earnings, it's got an earning stability of four, uh, you know, so wow. it's made wow. such a big difference on that, you know, stability of, of and the time. lower, the better, the, the, the lower, lower, the better, right. That goes from one to 99, lower being, you know, more stable 99, meaning that it's all over the place. So, um, yeah, I I interesting what that subscription as a service does, uh, you know, and, you know, they still have soft, you know, in addition to the software, they still have their hardware. So there is still that. Um, but you know, they're definitely becoming a predominant player in, in the enforce law enforcement and other things, uh, with both the cameras, tasers and, uh, other, other methods of non-lethal enforcement. So very interesting stuff. Uh, that's pretty much going to wrap it up for us. So, uh, glad you joined us and, uh, make sure you join us next week. I know we just had Mike Webster on, but you know, we've got to kind of, uh, you Can't know, have him on enough. Right, exactly. It's, it's you know we we had a we had a Mike Webster drought for a while there, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we have to get your money's worth, right? I yes. need to get their money's worth out of Mike <laughs> right, Webster. Right, exactly. He needs to be on the We're... podcast. He needs to be on IBD Live. He needs to be with Ali. He needs yeah. to be with everywhere. Get yeah, money's exactly. Worth. So we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have Webby join us again next week. Uh, this time on a different topic, we're gonna have him tackle volume. Uh, one of the reasons why he thinks uh, volume has gotten a little bit different lately, uh, what he calls dirty volume, and uh, this is something that we've been talking about on IBD Live, kind of setting up the cage match between David Ryan and Mike Webster, uh, chatting about volume at some point. But uh, we're gonna kind of get a little bit of his thoughts on that next week. So we hope you tune in for that. That's it for this week. Thanks a lot for tuning in. 
We'll see you next time. And don't forget to like and subscribe at investors.com slash podcast. See you next time.